Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this Tuesday edition of a Wednesday webinar slash spring training. We're excited to have you all here. We've got a big topic to tackle today. And that's House Bill 242 and the secondary metering requirements. Um, we've got, well, I'll count it as uh, four city managers now. Uh, Norm Beagley from Santa Quinn, Seth Perrins, and Chris Thompson from Spanish Fork, and Mark Christensen from Saratoga Springs. Uh, we're really excited to have this, this panel put together today. Um, all four of these folks have expertise in this and can help us give some guidance on implementation of what will probably be a complicated bill um, for the foreseeable future. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. I'll just one quickly uh, mention one quick piece of housekeeping first. I noticed there was a question on whether the session will be recorded. It is being recorded and we will post that online uh, likely this week and distributed in Friday Fact. So if you're unavailable to uh, watch the whole presentation, we will get that out to you. And then lastly, uh, please feel free to ask questions as you go through either the chat box or through Q&A, and we will try to address them as questions come in. Um, I will drop my information at the end. So if anybody has any additional questions or anything comes to mind after we finish, then you can feel free to reach out to me and I will share your questions with the panel. So. Without uh, further ado, Mark, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Carson. Appreciate that, and and uh, thanks uh, for my fellow panelists. Um, the the uh, the thing that we would like to do with with you all today is to kind of walk through this uh, this bill, um, really less in the text and less concerned about kind of the text of the bill, but really more, how do you go about implementing this for your community? I, I think those of us on the panel, um, we've, we've implemented and we've gone through the, the gauntlet, if you would, of, of what things you might expect, what things you may want to consider. Um, we wanted to provide some information that hopefully is timely for you, that helps you understand kind of the challenges that you're about to face as you approach water metering, some things for you to consider, uh, some of the pitfalls that, that we stepped into, and, and some of the challenges that we experienced, as well as some of the things that, that you may want to consider to help make your process go smooth. Now, um, you know, I'll let Seth and Norm and, and Chris jump in and, and uh, Aaron as well. Um, we're excited about the opportunity that we have for this. Um, we are excited that the legislature heard our concerns a year ago when water metering was a really big issue. Uh, and, then, and then they came back this session and made um, funding available to really help us be successful with this. So we think this is a positive step. Uh, I think all of the cities that have implemented, I'll let them speak for themselves, believe that it's the absolute right thing to do for us to help conserve water and help stretch our resources, as well as frankly, it's, it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. Um, depending on how you want to look at this, this is one of those things that will help you save a bunch of money as you have to look at expanding infrastructure and other things. Yes, metering is expensive, uh, but the cost to build ponds and tanks and, and booster pumps and additional infrastructure will be much more expensive um, if we can't uh, help our residents use the right amount of water in, in their consumption needs. So we'll look at this from a couple different approaches. Um, fellow panelists, do you have any opening thoughts or statements you want to make before we, we get too far into the, the nuts and bolts? I don't. I'll just add one thing, uh, Mark, <clears throat> for all that are, that are watching. This is, uh, we're, we're excited to do this because we've, we've been down this road, as Mark said, and we have uh, lessons learned. Some are, are good lessons to follow and others are bad lessons to not repeat. And uh, we are, I think, totally comfortable talking about all of our successes and failures. So if you have a question or thought as we go along and don't, don't hesitate to ask, even if it, it may be uh, you know, a negative thing that we may have to talk about in our, in our history, we're okay with it, right, Chris? We've, we've long since recovered from, from the days of our project in 2002 to 2004. And so we happy to answer those questions and make sure that this is, this is as meaningful for you uh, as it can be. Thanks. And, and frankly, there's others uh, that, that aren't necessarily on the panel, but have, have gone through this here fairly recently. And so they have, uh, they have some experience that you can share from as well. And so um, for those of you that, that have experience or, or um, looking for other, other um, cities to look to, um, we wanted to give you kind of a, a smattering of cities from a size and implementation standpoint. When we implemented in 20, 
2014, 2015, we, we put about uh, just under 5,000 meters into our system. Some of you will do much less than that. Some of you will do more than that. Um, we're currently now up to about, um, I'd say around um, 11,000 meters, uh, 10,000 meters in our city right now uh, for the secondary metering system. So um, we've, we've grown quite a bit in the last several years. Um, there are other cities, uh, for example, I think uh, Highland is in the process of implementing right now, as is um, Alpine uh, implemented just a couple years ago. And so there's some other cities that you can reach out to. Um, one of the things that we'll do in addition to this presentation, um, we'll, we've all agreed to share some of our information with you if you have questions about bond docs or um, you know, contracting, how we contracted some of our contracts, we're going to make that available through the league. So you can have that if you want to use that as templates for what you're doing. Um, please keep in mind uh, what we've done, work for our communities, feel free to use your creativity to work, work best and implement best in your communities. And, uh, and we're happy to help um, even after this uh, field questions if you've got them. So with that, uh, we will jump into our, our PowerPoint um, and, and this uh, was made available um, with the League of Cities and Towns after, um, after the spring session. So we haven't made too many tweaks to the, to the PowerPoint, but we do wanna make sure and, uh, and highlight some of the, the critical things. Um, we've talked a little bit with the elected officials. We may have some elected officials with us today. We had some in our training down in, in St. George, and um, hopefully we've got a few of, of you with, uh, with boots on the ground that we can help um, give you some advice as you look at and trying to implement this from a staff level as well. So um, let's jump right into it. Um, we've got, is that sharing okay, everyone? There we go. Um, the, the legislation that came out, basically said that, uh, you know, if you fall into these categories, we need to uh, begin implementing um, a metering system for our pressurized water, uh, secondary water. Um, and, and um, you know, it's, it's really not an option anymore. It's, it's not a choice. It's something that we're going to get to do. And again, I think the legislature's given us uh, a lot of incentive to try and help this be successful. So for example, beginning in, in 2020 right now, and I believe those grants are already in for this year, um, we've got 70% uh, cost that you can, you can help get funded uh, through the state through some of the funding that they've set aside for this. And then as you can see, it begins to decline as the years progress. Um, our hope is that those of you looking to implement a secondary metering system, um, that you jump on this and you get going as fast as you can. Um, in our case, it took us a little while to implement because we had some, um, some challenges. Uh, some of the city had, um, had meter sets already there and, and they were ready to go with just installing meters and other parts of the city were retrofits and the retrofits were much more expensive um, than just going out and placing a meter in a box that's already there. So um, again, depending on your city, we're hopefully gonna give you some ideas on, on how you wanna implement this. Um, you see that the costs continue to um, uh, go down as time progresses. And then ultimately, um, you know, by about 2030, um, that's when funding um, is expected to, to kind of get small. And, uh, and hopefully if, if we need more funding, there might be more funding available. We'll have to see how, how things go with everyone um, in this process. I do wanna point one other thing out, and, and this was in, in rows uh, three, 307 through 311. And, and I think some of us are struggling still to try and understand what exactly this might mean, but I wanna bring this to your attention. It says, a meter purchased with grant money um, under this section shall allow for data communication between the meter and other devices designed to manage use of secondary water that is open and available to an end user and open so that it can integrate with third party providers. I don't think any of us quite know exactly what this means, but we think that uh, um, we've been playing with the data in Saratoga and we've had some you know, interesting success with that. And we're excited about what we've been able to do. Um, I'm not quite sure what this is gonna look like from a much larger perspective. And if any of the, my co-panelists would like, they, they can pontificate, but um, I'm not sure what this is gonna look like for all of us. And I think we're gonna have to try and understand what exactly this is gonna mean. But um, think uh, what I want to, to draw your attention to right now is as you begin to implement your system, you're gonna to wanna to think about the end result of what you're trying to accomplish. And one of those things is to take the data 
and uh, use that data to help your residents understand their consumption and their behaviors and patterns. One of the things that we've done is we've actually uh, got a website that we worked with uh, Weber Basin Water um, to put up and we piggybacked on some of their technology. Um, and we're excited because we've offered a portal which allows our residents to literally log in and within about an hour of, of uh, you know, about every hour it, it updates and they can see their water consumption on an hourly basis. And uh, they can control their water, they can understand what they're using. And so from our perspective, 307 to 311 talks about how do we provide information and how do we get information into the hands of our residents so they can make informed usage decisions. Um, but it also ties into a lot of different things um, depending on how you want to integrate that with your SCADA and other things. There's a lot of very interesting data sets that are going to come out of this. So let's talk a little implementation. Um, and I'm going to let Seth talk a little bit about this, but let's be very clear. This is about water metering, but the biggest issue you're going to face when you consider that you're about to put a meter into every person's front yard in your city, um, every business, every church, every school, uh, you know, every commercial business, it's going to be impactful. And remember that uh, the politics of this are going to be kind of rich, and you're going to have some challenges associated with that and public perception. Um, the residents are going to have a pretty high level of expectations of how we're going to do this. Um, we're going to give you some advice and feedback on what you're going to want to be looking for on how you implement and making sure that you can avoid some of the pitfalls that we've had. And again, this is, uh, you're, you're, you're dealing with this, the sacred cow, if you would, of, of people's front yards. And when you cut into their landscaping or when you're, you know, putting in a, a, a utility box or something like that, remember that this is going to be something that they've put their blood, sweat, and tears into putting their yards in. And so remember, this is more than anything, it's, it's a public perception and there's some politics associated with that. Um, any, any thoughts on politics or how, how we implement, again, thinking with the end in mind? But one thing just to touch on here, Mark, and we'll probably touch on it again towards the end of in one of those later bullet, bullet points of rates, but managing the expectations of the residents is super important because you, uh, like you said, you'll be in their yard, you'll be touching every, every home probably. And <clears throat> If they know what you're doing, uh, it goes a lot easier. If they know why you're doing it, it can be a lot easier. But what, one thing that you can do is, is set an expectation with your mayor and council. You, you need to have a rate structure that you've, you maybe have never have had before. Uh, if your system is one of those that you pay X dollars and, and the water flows however much you use, and, and now you're going to have a meter, so you're going to have some some. Uh, some rate structure. I would hope, uh, frankly, that you have some kind of rate structure so that you can can begin to conserve. Uh, our experience is that when we have a rate structure, we, we saw a decrease in water consumption and we didn't see a decrease in, in beauty, if you will. But uh, managing the expectations of your elected officials, if they come in with uh, both all guns, if, if they come in guns a blazing and they set a rate structure that's really, really punitive, uh, our experience back in 2002, 2004, let's see, it was the election of 03 and then the next election of 05, we had 100% turnover in our elected officials because we were too aggressive in our rate structure. And so uh, we, we didn't do a good job of, of tempering the expectations of, of the elected officials and we didn't do a good job of managing the expectations of our public. And uh, we saw 100% turnover, which is really hard for a city uh, to go through uh, because everything changes when you have all the elected officials and, and whether they were good or bad, that's not really for us to debate. It was just the, the massive turnover that in two years we had all, all the change. And so <clears throat> if we could go back in time and do that differently, we would, we would have communicated more clearly with the residents why we were doing this and the value that would come from it. And we'd, I think, have a different rate structure uh, to grow into our uh, our tiers. I don't know if that's helpful at this point in the conversation, but that's what I've got to add. Mark, yes, yeah, specifically, <clears throat> set a relatively high base rate that's charged all year round, and then set a usage rate uh, at 
kind of a ease into it level and then just kind of plan each year to, to maybe raise the usage rate and, and, and if you don't need the extra funds lower the base rate and uh, uh, let the conservation kind of come in stages instead of all at once. Uh, otherwise, otherwise you just create so much angst and in the community and, and with inflation going on now, uh, I don't know that we want to just really hit the residents hard uh, all at once. Let's, let's ease into conservation and, and that's when you have less political backlash. Yeah. Well, Mark, I have a, a comment on that as well to Bruce Alstrom's comment there in Huntsville. We're not advocating for this. It's a done deal and it's a requirement. What we are advocating for is trying to help you, some of us that have already been through that, trying to help you navigate this and, and figure out how to meet the mandate from the state. It is a mandate from the state. It isn't a question of whether you can or can't do this. It is going to be punitive by 2030 if you don't do something. And the money is there. I mean, it's a partially funded man mandate, right? It's not fully funded, but it's better than nothing. And that's one of the things that Mark advocated for long ago and throughout this process was to get some funding because there's a lot of money involved in there. We, we understand that. We're not, we're not trying to say, you know, we're, we're pom-poms for this for the state. It's a done deal. And we're, we, we're just trying to help you the best that we can to navigate how to get this done and how to get the most funds that you can from the state to help you do that. So that's all I have. Thanks, Norm. And, and to that comment, um, you know, if, if you've got a relatively small system, this is going to be a much easier process. For our city, we had to have, um, we divided the city up into six different zones. And this is really kind of leading into that next bullet point of planning and strategy. Um, we, we had to, you know, divide the city up and we bid it so that there was potentially six potential zones that, that we would have different contractors working on in our city. That, that was close to 5,000 um, 5, meters. So it was a challenge and uh, we realized this is gonna be tough. And, you know, um, as Norm said, this really isn't a debate about um, if this happens, it's a question of how much can you um, have the state funding help you and your citizens keep their rates down by, by using that state funding that's available and implementing the system. Um, we hit this, and, and I think this ties to the politics a little bit, um, we hit this discussion and for whatever reason, it, it just happens to be during a pretty big drought discussion um, that we're having with our community and statewide. And so the fact that we're in the middle of a drought and we're trying to implement meters and conservation is really an important thing. So we realize it's sensitive and we recognize everyone has different needs. For us, I'll share a slide. My next slide will talk a little bit about what we got, why we got into this, but it was purely fiscal sustainability. We could not continue to provide the level of service and consumption that people were using um, and, and did not have some pretty serious financial implications going forward. So for us, it truly was a financial um, uh, escape escape hatch, if you would, for the, the trends that we were on. So it was pretty important. So um, first bit of advice we would give, besides be thinking of the end in mind and how you want to implement and how you want to set your rates and things, um, I would say adopt a standard for your city that, that makes sense. Um, for example, all of us have standards, each of the cities that have implemented across the state that's not on this panel, but they've implemented. Um, pick a standard that works for you. Pick a meter set that works for what you're doing with your water system. Pick you know, pick an ERT or um, a radio read technology that works for your community. You may want to just do hand reads, which is absolutely appropriate. Um, but uh, if you have an opportunity and want to look at fixed networks, we've been able to, to have some pretty good success with fi fixed networks and, and having radio read technology uh, working in our community. But, but again, what, what is it that you want to accomplish? How do you want your system set up in the long term? And then um, make sure that you've, you adopt a standard. The, the reason that we push the standard so hard is every building permit that you, you issue after you've set your standard, they're doing part of your job for you. Um, the most expensive part of this will be retrofitting existing homes with the meter sets and putting in meter boxes and doing that because it's a retrofit, um, especially if you're in a high growth community. Our city right now has you know, something close to 2000 building permits out right now. Um, for us, um, you, you can stop the hemorrhaging by getting your, meet, your standards set and then let the development world help you in putting in those new meter sets going forward. Um, 
we would strongly recommend some, some investigative research as you plan for your project. So for example, in our city, um, we had already, you know, had several, several, well, a few thousand homes in the city. We, we had a, a process where we went and did um, some early tests. We hired a contractor, paid labor and materials for them to go out and put these meters in. And we tracked that and we had them do several spots around the city. So we had a pretty good picture of what it was gonna take. And so when we bid the project, we had material lists, we had um, great time estimates of how much time it was gonna take to do these retrofits. We had some meter boxes that had been set. So we knew what it was gonna take to have, um, you know, just a meter set go in and that was, you know, you know, 20 something dollars or something like that. Um, and it was fairly inexpensive compared to in our dollars in 2014, 20, 2014, 2015, around $800 to do a retro, um, uh, you know, a retro install of, of a meter set. And that's probably closer to about $2,000 now from what we're hearing. Um, but, but do your research and figure out what your system's gonna look like and make sure you have some good data um, for how you're going to do this. The other thing that we did was we had G, uh, GIS coordinates. We went and shot all those coordinates in early. And so if you know where you're going to want to put your meter boxes, if you know where the valves are in your system, you can make the life of your contractor much easier because you can have that data ready for them. And I think that will help get you better prices as you bid this. The more information you can provide, the more information you can give them as, as far as the conditions are in your city and what to expect, the better pricing that you'll get and the less change orders you'll see as you go into it. Um, uh, next bullet here is a pilot project. Do you need one? Um, some cities, uh, I think, are just now implementing and they're putting in a secondary irrigation, pressurized irrigation system, and they're just installing meters as part of that. I think that's how Norm did it and Seth did it. Um, so in those cases, you're set. Now, you're set in the sense that you're installing your meter box as you're putting in your PI system. The problem with that is you're going to have bigger cuts on your roads. You're going to have much bigger impacts in your infrastructure. You're going to have a kind of a different project than what we had. And again, as you go into your project and as you're thinking about how you're going to implement, find another city that's similar to your city in size or a community that's done it similar in your size, similar in what they're doing. And then piggyback on the work that they've done. Use that work as really a step stool to help you be successful and have the, the, the least possible issues as you move forward with it. We've talked about public relations. Um, for us in our process, we had a, our, our contracts required the um, contractor to basically do a street at, the, at a time. So we could isolate that secondary meter valve, shut it off, and then they could work on a few houses and then, you know, limit the time of open cuts, limit the time of people's front yards being impacted, things of that nature, and, and, and really just have good public relations. Um, our contractors were required to put notices on people's doors a couple days ahead of time, letting them know that the project was going to be coming through. We were using social media. We were using the city's website. We were communicating as much as we possibly could and helping to educate people. And then, frankly, um, you know, it's how do you deal with that backlash? We hired a public relations firm to actually help field the calls and help do a lot of the um, management, if you would, of the communication between the residents and the city. Um, as, as, as cities, we're all, overstaffed, all overworked and understaffed. All of us are going to have problems. Um, even a small implementation, if you decide we're going to install the meters in our own public works department, I think that's a great option depending on your size and your team. But you've got to be very careful because there is a lot of, of <clears throat> issues um, and a lot of communication issues, and you could quickly get inundated with questions and calls and concerns. Um, for us, we chose to have people work in kind of a week-long increment, and between Monday and Friday, they would open up a street, they would put the boxes in, they would do the meter sets, they would get everything done, and then they'd restore the landscape. But before they put a shovel in the ground, we had them take pictures of the front yard or of where the meter was going to be set so that if there were concerns, you wouldn't have necessarily a debate over, you know, whether we restored the landscaping appropriately and things of that nature because we documented it. And then <clears throat> those cuts could be open for that week. And then they had to close things up by Friday and then they could move on. And if they got done early in the week, great, we'd let them open up another cut. But we always wanted to make sure that we didn't have you know, big holes in people's front yards over weekends. We didn't want to just let them, you know, let contractors go and leave big swaths of damage. We wanted within one week, the water shut off, 
the meters are put in, the meters back on, the landscape's restored, and you're moving on to the next project. You've checked for leaks and you're ready to move on. So again, think about how you wanna do your process. Think about how you wanna do that because Again, if you're trying to restore landscaping at the end of the summer, when everyone's had their front yards ripped up for an entire season or something like that, you're gonna have some pretty negative um, feedback going. So again, think of people that they're, they're invested in their front yards, they're invested in their homes. You wanna get in, you wanna make it a clean project, you wanna get out and you want great customer service. You wanna have people you know, saying, look, they did a great job on mine so that when you go to the next block over, they've already heard from their neighbors about how clean the installation is going and how the process is going. So again, this can be a really great opportunity for you to get some great, great credit with your community as you, as you move through this. Educate. Uh, oh, go ahead. Let me, just, uh, let me just add a thought. I think this is an area where we can really affect positively the impact of, of what we're doing and we're negatively affected. And so just to add my, my, uh, my comments to what, what Mark has just said, a lot of times our staff are busy. And, and so depending on the size of the project, you might, it might be manageable. Uh, we had that, that one comment earlier, the 300 uh, connection system, that, that may be manageable. If it is something that you just you decide to keep in house and you don't hire additional staff, I think it's worth your time to sit down with those staff that will receive those phone calls, and that they understand and and have maybe an expectation from you, as you said it, from uh, your administration and your mayor and council. What is the level of priority these calls will receive and these issues will receive? Uh, and if you can determine that in, internally and set that ahead of time, then I think you'll have a good path going forward. If it's going to be too big, and, and I recommend strongly considering having some additional help come in because you will see a swell in the, the amount of work you have uh, as this project comes in, and then that workload will immediately you know, end after the project is completed, or mostly end after the project is completed. And so it may be worth having an outside firm come in. Uh, <clears throat> having that, a single point of contact where problems can flow and then having uh, coordination meetings with those project folks on a regular basis so they can be giving to you and to the contractor the issues and concerns and, and you can start to, uh, you can adjust as you're moving forward uh, in, a, in that public information that that, uh, that that public relations firm really will provide value for, for you, not just dealing with problems, but maybe avoiding future problems as you pivot and adjust throughout. Thanks, Seth. <clears throat> and knowing what, what your grant is gonna look like. So for example, all of us that are, that are presenting today, we, we didn't get state funding. Um, we did this because of whatever reasons our, our communities made those decisions. In our case, it was cheaper for us to install a few million dollars worth of meters than it was going to be to build new ponds, to build new um, booster pumps, to upsize water lines, and ultimately to buy new water rights. Um, there's a lot of cost when you think about the totality of your infrastructure going into your community. And for us, I, I think it's just a great opportunity you have to get some funding for this. So the next bullet point is, A, get your grant. Mark, yeah, sorry, we have a question uh, from Juan Garrido. How many meters were contractors able to install in one day usually? It, it kind of depends. So for example, I mentioned two different scenarios, the retrofit where you're actually digging in and putting a meter in, um, you know, you could get a few dozen of those in a week's time. And, and it depends on the size of the crews and how productive they are. If all you're doing is installing meter sets and taking a meter, putting it in the ground, again, we're going to want to talk about this, but, but those meter sets they just take, you know, 10, 15 minutes to put in, turn the meter back on and test, make sure there's no leaks. There's one thing that I want to point out with each meter and with each radio ERT, if you're installing ERTs uh, or, or radio read systems, um, you're going to want to make sure that for each address to save your utility billing clerks a bunch of time, you're going to want to make sure that you're very precise and that your contractors are very precise to make sure that meter number and that ERT number go and get attributed to the right utility account. In our city, we actually ordered our meters with scannable barcodes and um, they had barcodes on each of the meters and ERTs. So when a contractor was installing those, even though it may only take 15 minutes to install the meter, to turn it on, to make sure it's all, all ready to go and that's on average, 
Um, and that's with an existing meter set, we would make sure that they would take and peel that barcode off and put it on, you know, on a form that says, here's the street address, here is the new barcode for the meter, here's the new barcode for the ERT. And that way, when it goes to your utility billing clerks, they can just scan a barcode and attribute it to that account, rather than them having to hand type in a 16, 20 digit number with each piece of infrastructure that's getting built. So your question on time is really important for like a meter install. Again, I think if you think about if you've ever had to dig into your own irrigation system, which some of us have done, um, your, your couple hours to dig it out, to cut the pipes, to, to, to install it, and then to restore your, your landscaping. And so um, your, your couple hours, and again, the scale and scope of how you wanna let that happen in your city. So a few minutes if it's just a meter install, um, you know, an hour to two hours, depending on the size of the crew, depending on how fast they work, probably a good crew can get in and out um, in an hour, depending on, on how difficult that is going to be and depending on what the landscape is looking like and how they're going to have to restore that. But again, that's where you may want to do a pilot project to, to figure some of those things out and have some good data because you've installed a bunch of meters and you have a good picture of what that's going to look like. Um, sorry, I wish I had a, it's been several years, so I wish I had a better, better time estimate for you. I've got some data that we can share with the league that we can get out to you, and that will show the number of meters that teams are putting in, and we probably can find some of those old records and share those as well, if you're interested in help having us dig that. And again, all of us have, have agreed that we want you to be successful, so we'll help provide whatever information we can to help you be successful with those questions. Um, so going back to the, oh, go ahead, Carson. I was just saying, thanks, Mark. Well, oh, um, as far as um, we implemented a, a fixed network uh, radio system here in our city, we did that about two years after we installed all the meters. Driving around the city, we just realized it was not as good of, a, uh, of, a, of an option when you're reading that many meters. Um, there's over 20,000 meters in Saratoga Springs between drinking water and secondary water. So we transitioned to a fixed network system. If you have an opportunity to do that while you're installing, and if that's something that your community wants and needs, I highly recommend it. Get all the paint over at once instead of dragging it out over a couple of years. That's one thing that we definitely learned from. The value of that though is because of the website portal that we have, our residents can actually, we run reports every morning. My utility billing clerks run reports and say, hey, these are the meters that look like they're leaking. Um, here's these meters that have been running for more than 24 hours or whatever. We call our residents or, or we'll email them and let them know, hey, it looks like you've got a link in, leak in your drinking water system or in your secondary system. And imagine the amazing customer service that our community is starting to see because we've invested in this technology. It's helping them conserve. They understand that we're here to help them because we don't want to build them for water that's just flowing through their system because of a leak. And it's really changing the way that, that we see this. Um, the last thing um, that I want to kind of point to right now is fix everything at once. Um, we had installed these brass ball valves that had a different kind of metal on the handle. And what we had found as we started into this project is that these ball valves, um, A, they were expensive. Brass is, is expensive, but the handles would rot out. And we decided that we were going to just change kind of mid-process and install uh, PVC ball valves um, instead of these, these valves that were just rotting out um, in the ground. And so for us, that was a change that for us made a big difference. Um, and, and we could walk away from the project with our residents understanding that they had a ball valve shut off beyond the meter on their side of the meter that was in place and that was, was good. Um, again, depending on what your projects are going to look like, you know, don't, you know, don't leave a $15 part um, out of your project that you're going to have to come back and fix later because it's just not worth the time and effort to have to redig things up or do anything like that. Um, any other comments on fixing everything at once or anything up to this point? Okay. I would say the same thing, Mark. Fix it all at once. And I would also recommend for those municipalities or systems or districts or whatever that have any significant number and Chris Thompson, maybe from you can chime in here. If you're planning on having your public works crews do that, it's an opportunity cost. So you just have to realize that, that as, as Seth said earlier, all of us are busy and all of us have, quite frankly, more things than we can get to. If you're planning on having to do that, that's going to be a, a challenge and it's going to be an opportunity cost for your staff because you're just going to not get other things done. 
Yeah, and, and I think to that point, Norm, um, I can't imagine any city or, or, or special district or anyone along the Wasatch Front in Utah that has enough time to say, hey, we're going to take all of our public work staff and we're going to devote them to meters for the next four months. Um, it, 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 it would be a very daunting task at, at, at um, you know, depending on the size, a few hundred meters, maybe you can pull it off, but that, that would be a, a very impactful thing in your community. Carson? We have another question, and um, this one might be better to answer towards the end, so I'll just pose it to you, and you can decide if you want now or later. Uh, the question is, did you prepare the construction standards, drawings, and plans yourself, e.g. city staff, or did you hire an outside engineering firm? If so, uh, do you have any recommendations for firms that you used? Um, I would say whoever you're using from an engineering consulting standpoint, if you're already bidding out projects, use that group. They know your standards and specs. They know your processes. They're probably a good group. As far as standards go, all of us will make our standards available. In fact, probably they're available on many of our websites already. Um, we have, as a city, we have those as well, and we'll make those construction documents and everything available, and you can pick and choose what you want to use. Um, I had Alpine also tell me down in St. George a couple weeks ago that they would make their construction documents that are only maybe two years old, maybe three years old, they'd make those available as well. So we're happy to help point you in the right direction and make this as easy as possible, but standards and specs, um, pick what works for you and you probably already have water meters so you'll probably want to look at a technology that's going to you know mirror that and be comparable to what you're doing um, from uh, from that standpoint uh, other comments norm no i would just mirror that that's uh, I, we're not I, i'm not going to advertise for other engineering firms i would just go to what mark said and that is that just work with who you're working with, you're, you have a competent engineering firm, they're likely able to help you. But also I would say that this is not rocket science. This is something that you can do likely in-house. Again, if you have the staff and the ability to do it, but at the same time, if you don't, then, then we'll make our standards and docs and stuff available to municipalities and districts, not necessarily to engineering firms. I think, I think it, it would be good to have your engineering firm look at the standards of existing cities. I think over time you learn a lot about what works and what's needed. Some of the things when we first started out with meter pressure irrigation is we were worried about maybe air, air back issues in the meters. Uh, we found that that wasn't, that wasn't a problem uh, uh, where the, the meters are not as deep as, as drinking water meters. Uh, another thing is we, we had a similar issue to what Mark had with, with the hand valves. We were worried that we really needed to make sure it was easy for residents to turn their, their valves off and on. And so we put those brass ball valves with the, the handle on them. And after about four or five years, they all started rotting off. And so what we learned is that a traditional stop and waste valve uh, works the best and, uh, and residents can deal with that pretty easily. They just get little uh, stop and waste valves and, and uh, they can turn them on and off. And those last uh, seemingly uh, indefinitely. And so uh, having the handles on there uh, uh, wasn't necessary. Another thing that we worried a lot about that we didn't really need to was making sure there's a hose bib uh, for residents that didn't have a sprinkler system. And we felt like, well, we better go just outside the meter, put a little box with a hose bib in it so that uh, residents without sprinkler systems can, can put a, a hose on there and water the lawn still. Uh, we found that that uh, was rarely used uh, and that uh, even when residents actually didn't have sprinkler systems, they would, they would go and install the hose bibs where they wanted them in a more convenient um, location. And, uh, and so that's another thing that, that we put in initially that we found uh, wasn't, wasn't needed. I agree with Mark. It seems like when you crunch the numbers, a fixed network radio read system seems to be the most cost effective and is so much less expensive initially to put that in than to retrofit 
later. Uh, I also feel like it kind of future proofs you a little bit. Regulations seem to be ramping up, ramping up, and, and uh, uh, it, there may come a day where that's just required. And, and if we're required to have customer portals like what Spanish Ford has, where residents can log on and see what the real time usage of water is. Uh, you'll be really glad you have that radio read system. It also kind of helps with manpower. It's really hard to find meter readers or any staff right now. And so if you can eliminate that, that's really good. You, you maybe could argue, Chris, and, and if you want to jump back a couple of slides, <clears throat> Mark, to the language, you, you maybe could argue that uh, it's already you know, maybe even already mandates that you have that kind of a system. I, we're not attorneys and certainly weren't part of the debates on what was meant there, but with some of that language there in F, uh, it seems like a lot of that's only available with, with the radio read system. I think it's definitely kind of looking like it's going that direction. And so you may want to just kind of, in the name of future proofing your your, your investment, uh, look at that. For those of, of you that are putting in pressurized irrigation system, uh, new ones and then metering to, uh, out of the gate, uh, we learned a, a few things and that is boring the laterals makes a huge difference. If, uh, there, there were, was a city or two that, that open trench those laterals and as you drive down all the streets, you just you hear a bump every house and, and uh, that's a big deal. We, when we bid ours out, we, we bid that they had to be bored and it was interesting. Uh, we compared our prices to another city's and, and, and if, if the contractors didn't invest in boring equipment, um, uh, we ended up paying less. Uh, for board laterals and, and, and then we didn't have that bump every single house. Another thing, um, I think there are some options to, if, if you have the poly pipe, you can crimp the line, put the meter in and then uncrimp it or, or freeze the line, and put the meter in and then unfreeze it. There might be some options like that where you don't have to put a whole block out of water, something to look at. And then the um, last thing that I, I kind of thought would be really good to look at is I think the critical path here is going to be the actual purchase of your meters. Um, I would recommend bidding out your meters tomorrow and hopefully they'll come in within the next three or four years. Uh, it's really hard to get them. So it, it, before you do anything, I just bid out your meters and get it go to good feel for when they'll start coming in. Yeah, I, I don't know how others are right now. We ordered meters about six months ago and um, I shouldn't say six months, I should say January, it's not quite six months ago. Uh, we ordered some meters hoping that we'd have them in time for spring and we're being told that they'll arrive sometime in September, around September 15th. And so we just put in another year's worth of meter order um, we just put that in probably within the last 30 days and that won't arrive for at least a year. And so um, fundamentally this meter supply chain is going to be a big issue. And especially with so many people rushing to try and get meters, um, you got supply chain issues and think about what, you know, what you wanna use and the availability of those products. Because again, some of that will be impacted by the price that you'll be able to get reimbursed for, I believe. So, Mark, we, I we, we, we're just wondering if we'll have enough meters for the growth coming into the city. Uh, but also, I had one other comment on standards. Sorry, I wrote a few notes here. I, I think it's really important that you have a good traffic rated standard. You'd be surprised how many of these meters. Uh, get placed in driveways or, or, or places like that. And so that's something that has really plagued us, especially as, as frontages of lots has decreased. 
and three car garages have increased. Uh, a lot of the frontage of the houses is being dedicated to driveways and having a good traffic rated meter box uh, is, is, is really important, especially on new construction. Um, we have actually in, in Smash Fork gone to just requiring all meter boxes to be traffic rated. And we, we spec'd out one that actually includes the drinking water meter and the pressurized ir irrigation meter together in one box. And, and then it doesn't matter if someone pours a driveway around it or not. And the box is big enough, it's actually a lot easier to get in there, uh, change out a meter or, or, or work on it. We, we actually have uh, our secondary water lines that kind of is right on the property line between two properties. And then we just, we, we put the meter set right, splitting the line. And then we have one meter um, and their ball valve or their valve put into their yard and the other one we separated out. And so that worked really well for us. Um, but for those meters that happen to fall in driveways, I, I think Chris's point is excellent. Um, that, I don't know what the cost differential is between say your standard you know, green irrigation box that, you know, we're all familiar with versus a traffic rated one. But for sure, in those scenarios, you, you probably need to consider that. Yeah, the, the difference in cost between those boxes is about tenfold. But if you put a green box in and gets runs over, run over and, and, and your meter gets busted, there's your there's your tenfold right there. But I, I would also say don't let the meter availability or lack thereof deter you go get your funding go get the state funding that's available at a maximum this year and next year and if the meters happen to be two years out at least you have your 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 funding and you're not missing out on 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the available funding to help out yeah get your meter sets in the ground today even if you just got a jumper until you can get your meters that's that's probably your best your best your best bet and, and again, um, the installation, the, the cost of the meter is small in comparison to the overall box set um, and, and actually getting that installed. So again, chase the dollars as appropriate for your community. Carson, did you have another question? Yeah, there's two questions regarding the brands of meters. First, um, what brand or brands have your cities used? And do you, would you recommend them or wish you had picked a different kind? Um, you know, I'm going to speak over the course of my career. I've had some meters that I've loved and I've had some cities with meters that we didn't like them at all. Um, we're using a Badger, um, meter right now and, uh, Nitron Ert, and we seem to be very pleased with that. Um, but again, I'm not, I'm not going to endorse a product over another. I would say, look for a meter that um, they've got mag meters now that are, I don't know if it's a mag meter, but meters that don't have small parts that can get jammed. Years ago, we had, you know, small propellers and things that were getting, you know, just destroyed by a little, you know, imperfections or impurities in the water. And it was just a nightmare. So um, look at what your water system's like, look at what you've got, um, you know, look at, look at your system and, and defer to your staff, talk to your water people. You know, talk to your public works guys, let them have a very in-depth say on what you're doing, because they're going to give you some of the best advice that you can get as far as what's going to work well for your city. And then one more question for Chris Thompson in Spanish Fork. Does having both the drinking water and secondary water meters in the same box increase cross connections? Uh, we, we haven't had that problem. Uh, I think cross connections are, are mainly a big issue when you're going from only one water system to two. And that's when you gotta be very concerned about cross connections. If you're going that route, which I think probably there's not a lot of that out there. Uh, it's a big commitment to go to a whole nother system at this stage. But if you are, what we did is we locked, we put a lock on all the pressurized irrigation meters and then they had to have an inspector come out and just make sure there wasn't a cross connection before we unlocked it. Yeah, and make no mistake, you're gonna to need to have your inspectors, your public works inspectors watching these consultants. Um, we had 
six areas of the city that were being built. Um, all six of those had zones that were being developed at one time. We'll share with you a little bit of data here in a second on that, but you're gonna be heavily making sure that those boxes are put in right and that infrastructure is put in right. So it's gonna be pretty big. Um, any other questions, Carson? Nope, you answered them, thank you. All right, uh, just the, the meters, we use a census and a badger as well, but the one thing you should know for, for those of you that have just secondary systems, you worry about mechanical parts. Most of the meters nowadays don't have mechanical parts and don't have the issues that, that even just 10 or 15 years ago were an issue. So you, you should be able to find a meter that will meet your needs, even if you've got a lot of sand or grit or organics or whatever in your water. Yeah. So uh, I think Chris pointed something as well. Um, our ability to try and keep up with meters, Saratoga Springs, we have just under 2,000 building permits that are, that are under construction right now. Um, you can see our population growth over the last 20 years. It's, it's incredible to go from 2,000 people in 2000 to 48,000 people in 2020. Um, that's the kind of growth that's happening all over the state. And for us to just keep up with meters, we're, we're easily 100, 150 meters a month that we're putting in the ground just to keep up with our new growth. And um, on top of that, these meter projects are going to be big. But for us, we were using too much water. We could not keep up with the consumption. And so we were either going to have to upsize the system substantially or we're going to have to install meters. That's why we made the choice. Um, that choice was made for you all during the legislative session. Um, and so we, we approach it from different ways. Um, but, but for us, we were using... Um, with the city about 25 to 30 percent built out, we were using ponds that had been built for our build out size and people were over consuming, you know, four or five times the amount of water that they should have been using. We were doing some test irrigation metering and we just had to change what people were doing in order to do it. Frankly, the, the math just worked out, you know, spending five million dollars on meters and, uh, 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 you know, fixed network read system was cheap compared to literally, you know, doubling the size of all of our ponds and, and all of our infrastructure and buying new water rights. And so that was easy math for us. Um, this is Saratoga. This is what we dealt with in 2013. We had 933 secondary meters that we put in the ground that we used as kind of that test to see how much water people were consuming. And this is before we had implemented any sort of conservation rates. And then in 2014, um, we installed all of the meters throughout the city. And, and again, we had two types. One was we were just putting meters in boxes and one we were actually putting um, the meter sets in the grounds and, and, and having to retrofit a home so that we had those meter sets um, that were uh, available. And I've got some images and things that we can share on that. Um, again, our costs in, in, uh, in, uh, you know, the retrofit connections was somewhere between 250 and a thousand dollars. 250 was putting a meter in an urt in a box and a thousand dollars was putting a box in the ground so that you could have your meter connection. Again, our, our water lines were not in our streets. So our city, because of our standards, um, all of our water lines drinking are, are in one park strip, our secondary are in the opposite side of the street parking strip. And so for us, it was quite, quite easy to do this project without a whole lot of road impacts. So in that regard, we were very easy, uh, e less impacted than, than some of you that might have, you know, water lines and other issues that you're going to be putting into the roads and things like that. Um, yeah, Carson. We have a question, Mark. How much reduction of water consumption have you seen once the meters were installed and the rates were tiered? So uh, we got about, uh, it cut in half um, in that first year, and we continue to see people um, consuming less and less. The challenge is, is we're growing so fast. We're in um, teens, mid-teen, you know, population growth. And so for us, even though year over year, um, we're adding so many people, um, we're, we're, we're seeing these water savings. It's difficult for us to say exactly um, how much we saved, but, but it's easy to say that we cut it instantly in half. And for our community, um, we had residents that were complaining because we didn't have adequate water pressure in the tops of pressure zones because literally we would drain a, a, a 20 acre foot pond overnight um, with people just, you know, watering for all night long. We had people, we were in a stinking desert. We had people, you know, growing mushrooms in their front yards. Uh, we had basements and houses um, settling and sinking because of the, 
you know, the, the collapsible soils in our community. I mean, talk about the expense of a water meter compared to, you know, peers on a house. I mean, there, there's some easy savings we can get by helping people conserve. Uh, but again, um, we got we got down quite a quite a bit and we're pleased. Um, I think all of us had to recently go back and look at our water standards, our drinking water standard, we're down to um, 0.3 of an acre foot per household for drinking water. Um, and um, we were at 0.45. So we, we reduced uh, drinking water, again, through education and helping people understand their consumption. Um, we've got that number down and we adjusted our standard a couple of years ago to go down to that third of an acre foot um, uh, or just 0.3 of an acre foot. Um, and that's indoor, outdoor though, we're, we're basically, and, and this is something that we'll, I'll allude to now. Um, we, we want, yeah, go ahead. Can we, can we answer that question as well? You bet. Yeah, I think I think the minimum is twenty five percent. It's probably twenty five to fifty percent once you start metering. So that's a huge savings. Uh, we were looking at the numbers, and it looks like we're we're meeting the governor's twenty thirty water conservation goals. Uh, and I and I think it's largely because of because of metering and rate structures that you can only do if you do metering. Uh, one thing with with meters is you have to commit to a certain brand of meter uh, and spec that out. I don't think you generally want very many different types of meters in your system. Um, someone asked the question, what type do we use and what, what's the experience? Uh, I hope this is okay. I don't think it's a problem, but uh, we use the census uh, kind of like what San Quinn does and it's the eye pearl meter uh, three quarter inch and it seems to be working well. So touching on that, you, I think you, your graph that you had a few moments ago, Mark, uh, kind of highlights potentially the, the ROI that you can have uh, from this kind of a project where <clears throat> as you delay future infrastructure projects because you don't need them as fast as you thought you might, or even perhaps ultimately eliminate because you don't need the, the size of pipes, you don't need that second or third uh, tank or reservoir, uh, you might ultimately see all of the money come back to you uh, that you put into the metering project over, over time because of these delayed infrastructure costs because you start to have less consumption. I don't know that we had any houses settling like in Saratoga Springs, but holy cow, is there a is there a more, is there a, is there a better picture of, of what, uh, what we ought not be doing? Um, and that the, I'm sure those folks weren't bad people. They just didn't have any reason to think about the amount of water they were using. And if they didn't think about it, they'd never know. Well, so and, and yeah, I, I think, um, I think this is our water data from last year. Um, again, this is us, you know, saying, Hey, look, we, we've, made a pretty big impact um, for us our, our our structure our water rate structure and let me let me maybe take a step back our water rate structure is tiered for us so that based on the lot size and how much water was dedicated at the time of plat recordation for each home that's what we're trying to encourage people to get their consumption down you know if you're using the water that was dedicated to your house or you're using less than what was dedicated for your lot then that's the ideal goal for us we want people just staying within their allotments. And so for us, we have this calculator that was created by Spencer Kyle, um, who um, basically let people put in their lot size in that little blue field there. And then basically um, we would show people that based on their previous rate prior to us implementing our new rate structure, your new base rate would be much less. And then depending on your consumption, if you consumed your allotment or less, then your rate would stay, would be cheaper. And then if you went over it just a little bit, it's about break even. But if you're using much more than what your, your dedicated water right was, that's when you started to get into the higher tiers of, of, of water pricing and consumption based on those thousand gallons. And so this, this is on our website. So if you're interested, go to Saratoga Springs and go to our utility billing um, page and you can pull this up. This is a, it's a, it's a, it's a Google Drive um, calculator that you can download, that you can plug in different things. And frankly, this was part of the education of what we did with our residents was, 
invite them into open houses, let them use the calculator. We actually have a, a water zone um, calculator as well so that they could say, hey, if I wanted to stay, keep my water usage under 25,000 gallons in a month, here's how long I could run each of those zones. And we encourage people to water every third day or more. So you know, every third day as opposed to every other day. So we're, we're encouraging people to conserve. And especially in a year like now, we're saying don't start watering until you absolutely need to. Water is, is you know, the minimum that you need to. Um, but, but again, providing ways that people can calculate how much water they're consuming and, and have those online calculators or have access to web portals, it's really important for them to be able to consume. But in this particular scenario, because of our new rates, we actually, people were spending less on their base rates based on, on our water conservation plan and our tiered rate strategy. Um, frankly, it's, it's worked very well for our residents. And again, I was showing a, a data slide here of just last year's consumption. Um, within the, um, you know, everybody kind of goes through the rate structures, but, but again, a lot of people were able to use, uh, you know, keep their rates and their usage down. And we have, you know, few people that are getting up above their rates considerably, but, but compared to what we were seeing before, that's just, it's, it's an incredibly good turn for us as far as water consumption goes. Um, we've got, we've got some examples here of some meter sets and some other things. Um, but, but let's talk, let's talk a little bit of, of strategy and let's talk a little bit of, of these meter standards. Again, this was what looked like a typical setup for us. We'd have the meter box and then a few feet away, we'd have, you know, valve box. We've replaced that, that valve. Um, and that's where their system really, um, you know, would begin was, was off of that shutoff valve. Um, again, decide what kind of rates you want, get, a, get the word out early and really communicate with your people. Make sure you've got plenty of access on your website for how people can get information and help explain the project. Frankly, as you're doing each step of these projects, you should be putting it on your social media or on your websites and making information available so that people understand what's happening. Um, we ran into, you know, this is a, our, our typical uh, valve boxes. As I mentioned, we have these two meter um, irrigation boxes. One is for, you know, basically each side of the property line. Um, and, and you can kind of see one of the things that, uh, that we wanted to make sure that we were doing was very tight control of the inventory. So one thing that you'll wanna consider, you don't wanna just give your contractor a pallet load of, of meters and say, go out and, and install these meters. You wanna have your city broken down to where you have very specific, you know, you're giving them the number of meters that they need for that week, especially if meters are scarce as you're doing your implementation. You wanna make sure that, as I mentioned earlier, you have barcodes on those meters so that you can make it super easy on your utility billing clerks as they're putting that into your system. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure that, you know, the meters that you've got, you're tracking those and, and they're being put into, um, you know, you put into the to the to um, the city in, a, in an organized fashion. Um, this is what a front yard is going to look like as you get into kind of some sort of an install. This is a C single home, so you can see kind of a, a single meter uh, installation, and then you can see kind of a dual installation where it's it's servicing perhaps duplexes or something like that. So again, as I was mentioning before you're ripping up someone's front yard. Take pictures before you get into the grass. Take pictures before you rip into it and make sure that you understand that. If the, if the resident's home, make sure your contractor and your staff is communicating with them so that they understand what's going on. For us, we did a pilot project. And so, as I mentioned, we went and did, did pilots, uh, you know, pilot um, explorations, if you would, all over the city of what it was gonna look like. We took track of, kept track of time and materials. Um, we made sure that we understood what it was going to look like. We understood that when we restored the yard, it looked pristine and we had a good process put in place. So again, as we did that, we created parts lists. We, we figured out what kind of difficulties we were going to have and what kind of challenges we were going to have at those various points of connections. And again, um, we, we, we picked the areas based on the approximate age of when their infrastructure was put in the ground. So we would kind of see how different materials we're a relatively young city, but we could see the different types of materials that were used by different builders in different areas of our city. And so we were able to take that information and make a really good bid package based on our pilot uh, phase of our project where we piloted that and really had a good, um, good view of what it was going to look like. Um, remember, 
people are going to have dogs, um, dogs and pets and things of that nature. That's going to be a challenge. Um, make sure that your contractors are putting notes on people's doors. Um, you know, we were working within our utility um, easements, so it was really easy for us to, you know, not have to worry about getting permissions and things. But depending on where your utility easements are and where these meters are going to be put in people's yards, you need to make sure that you've got the the ability and the rights to go in and put those meter boxes in in the appropriate spots. So be thinking about those things up front as you're designing your system and how you want to put it in. For us, we did all this pilot phases. We then went into our construction phase. We hired a, a, you know, a public involvement consultant um, to help communicate. Um, for us, we divided our city up into six zones. Ultimately, we had two contractors that were awarded um, two different areas of the city. They had larger crews and they could do that. And then we had um, you know, two contractors that, that got these bids in these different schedules. And so for us, we could tell because we had GIS data for our city, city, some of them were going to be just putting meters in boxes. When we bid the various sections, um, kind of on this, uh, this green um, kind of blown up sheet, and I've got examples of these in the documents that we'll share, the, the contractors knew which of those they could go in, and it was just going to be going in and easily putting in a meter, and it was, it was just putting a meter in a box, and it was not much of a problem. The red zones in this particular map um, of this blown up area was kind of indicative of, oh, by the way, these are where you're going to have to go in and retrofit. You're going to have to dig meters. Um, they were some multifamily products and some other things where it was going to be a little bit more of a challenge to put those in. And so, again, we had our bid documents set up so that we could bid these out and people could know exactly what they were getting. And then the contractor pricing, you can see that on the slide as well. Carson, you had a question? Yeah, there's a question from Rob Dotson. What percentage of your city is still using culinary for irrigation and are developers required to install secondary irrigation when there isn't secondary available yet? So we were using cross connections because we were over consuming on secondary water. We were actually supplementing drinking water into our secondary system. Um, we've since cut that off with very few cross connections. So now um, with the exception of like one or two neighborhoods, which still don't have secondary meters or secondary water to it. And it's, it's like a hundred homes or something. Um, I believe every area of our city has been converted to secondary, secondary water. Um, we have cross connections to supplement if we need to, but we're buying extremely expensive water from central Utah. For those of you that are buying central Utah, um, it's about $19,000 an acre foot. Uh, for the capital portion of the water, um, and then we're paying, you know, five, six hundred bucks a year for the, the OM and R on that. So that's expensive water. You don't want to be putting that on the grass if you can avoid it. Instead, we've actually got pumps on the lake as well as we're taking water straight from irrigation canals. And um, we're largely, that's largely how we're, we're uh, putting our water in. We do have wells um, that we're also putting into our secondary system, our PI system. But for the most part, it's, it's all secondary um sources at this point and we have we have about 25 percent of our town that's on culinary source and we're converting a large portion of that 25 percent this year with a new tank and booster pump station so we're we're moving away from just like mark did using precious culinary water for watering lawns as far as requiring the developers it's part of our standards so we we do require them and again i i can't make a strong enough plug here get your standards in place today don't improve, don't approve another subdivision without having your standards in place because that requires the developer to pay for it, both the, the system and the meters, rather than relying on this 70% or 60% or 30% fund you can get from the state. Don't let another subdivision go by that's not already submitted. Don't, don't get yourself in a pickle that way. But if they're subject to your current standards, you got to let them through. But don't let another subdivision get submitted and, and get approved under the old standards. Get your standards in place today or tomorrow or the next day. Chris, did you have a comment? I think that's really great advice from Laura. Uh, we, we have a few, less than a percent uh, still on, on drinking water. And that's in a very rural area that annexed. Uh, we ran water lines out to it, but the houses are, you know, on 20 acre to 40 acre lots. And so it doesn't make sense to do it right now, but in areas out there as homes get built or developed, we, 
we require them to either do cash in lieu or, or put in some infrastructure so that when the water gets out there, when the pressurized irrigation water gets out there, it can be done. Yeah, that's a good one. Carson, do we tackle that? All right. So again, this is illustrative. Uh, 5,000 meter install. Some of you are going to be doing more. Some of you, you know, maybe that's more than you're ever going to have in your entire city, and that's okay. But again, for us, we took, we, we used our GIS data to take and map out our city, divide it up so that we were roughly bidding the same amount of meters in each of those areas. And then we were very specific to say, okay, you can open up this area. Here's the meters that you're going to need for the next two, you know, the next week. We're, our inspectors were on the ground with them throughout the week, making sure that everything was testing, everything was getting, getting bought off and done well. And then basically uh, moving on, some lessons learned for us. Again, limit the time that excavations can be left open. I showed some, some pictures. If you leave someone's front yard open up like that for more than a couple of days, you're going to start getting some, some complaints and concerns. Um, every day that they can't throw water on their grass is going to be a day that they're panicking and stressing. Um, get, those, get those excavations closed uh, quickly. Get the backfill in, even if you're not putting sod down until like some of our contractors would backfill, and then they'd come in on Friday and put sod in. And Friday was their day where in the afternoon, you know, half of their crew was just putting sod in and making sure that everything was pristine when they walked away from it. Um, again, um, one thing for us is don't delay if you're, if you're installing your system. We had a couple of instances where contractors got out of the irrigation system. They were installing meters after the system was down and closed. And frankly, the next spring we had leaks all over because we couldn't test it. And, and getting people back was hard. Um, getting people to come back, contractors to come back and fix landscaping several days, weeks, or months after they have put something in. Um, it's just, you don't have as much teeth and you don't have as much ability to, to help things go right. We had great contractors. I wanna say that we had a phenomenal experience. We had a great public relations group that helped coordinate it. They would get calls and complaints. And then every week when we met with that contractor, we would be specific and say, here's the complaints that we received from your area and your part of the city. How are you going to deal with these concerns and how are you going to go back and solve these customer service complaints? And so on a weekly basis, we held the contractor accountable. We were being held accountable by the citizens. We held the contractor accountable and we went back and tried to solve the problems and it worked really, really well. Again, if you let too much time gap between when complaints are being handled, when that information is being disseminated to them to go back and fix it, the harder it is. And then you guys all understand that social media is, you know, it's, it's a pro and a con and you're going to get filleted in social media and you're going to have a lot of people that are going to hold you accountable. And so you need to monitor the social media and make sure that you are being extremely responsive and giving the very best customer service you have. On another note, I want to point something out. I think the legislature did a great job of stepping up to the plate and making funding available for us. This is our reality. This is our world. Um, some of us feel like this is a, a really wonderful thing because it's the right thing to do from a fiscal conservative standpoint, from an environmental standpoint. Um, you control the message in your community. And if you approach it as if, hey, the state's making us do this, we're not happy about it, we're kicking and screaming, then that's probably the same kind of response your residents are going to sense and feel. And that's what it's going to turn into in your community. Instead, this is the right thing to do if you look at it from a financial standpoint, if you look at it from an environmental, let's water conservation standpoint, it's, it's a good thing. It's the right thing for us to be considering. There's other ways where more savings and, and more conservation can take place. This is our, our, our world. This is what we can control. And so do the very best that you can to, to get good positive mes messages out there. Um, one thing that was a lesson learned for us was some of the points of connection were buried really deep. And um, we had to figure out, you know, how do you pay people for a point of connection that's super deep and things like that. So we had to... We had to kind of figure that out. So for those of you that are going out to bid, realize that not all lines are built exactly to your standard of three, four feet below ground or whatever that number is. Um, and, and so again, you'll want to build some contingencies in and get some upfront pricing for some of these types of things so that you're not just getting huge change orders outside. Isolate the pain and fix everything you can while you're there. 
Um, this is an example of our meter sets, our ball valves. This is kind of, you know, what things look like when you have these open holes and open trenches. And again, um, um, some, we did have some homes where we had multifamily housing and we had like dual backyard services. And so we had to have different, slightly different standards for that. And again, um, you're going to want to consider the various types of things that you may encounter in your community and come up with standards that kind of deal with what that might look like, you know, dual front yard meters, um, other things that we experienced. Some people had taken our meter boxes where we had these meter sets and we had jumpers in them um, and they took and, and installed um, filters in it. And so when we came back to install meters, we had water filters that were you know, sitting inside these boxes and we had to kind of work with neighbors to help them get their meters outside of our boxes and get them reinstalled back in their yards, things of that nature. So um, again, you're gonna experience some interesting things, document uh, everything you can and try and, and work with your residents to make sure you restore their landscape. This, this example is a shrub bed service. Um, I would highly recommend you, you bring some consultants in to help you do your rate studies because we need to make sure that we're doing our rate studies appropriately. We use Zions Bank. There's a lot of great firms out there. Um, you know, use the firm that, that you're most comfortable with that can help you implement it. Um, we talked quickly about wire uh, fixed networks and stuff like that. I wanna just quickly hit on that. Driving around your community, if you've got a few hundred meters, maybe that works for you. And even in small communities uh, that I've worked in, um, it gets to be a big task when you have one or two people spending a full day driving around to get your meter reads done. So um, think of a fixed network system. Think of what that might look like. Um, for me, I get an endpoint report uh, every day. And so I can see how many endpoints we have in the city. I mentioned we had just, just about 20,000 meters in the city. That's both drinking and secondary. Um, this is the report that I get. And so I can tell you there's 10 meters that are out there that are saying, quote unquote, they've never been read. Um, those are largely bypass meters that we have on like schools or something else. So, you know, if we had to pull their main meter, we could have a bypass meter. Um, but again, um, sometimes people are on vacation. Sometimes meters just don't read in the last 24 hours because someone parked a, uh, you know, a travel trailer over the top of their, uh, their sidewalk or whatever. So again, there's, there's various things, but you can use data to help you be very successful in managing it. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned, we, we cut our consumption down, you know, year to year, we were just really pleased with how much we were able to, to get people's consumption down. Um, and so again, um, it's gotten better as we've continued and as we continue, um, be aware, there's going to be a lot of positive media that you guys get to take the advantage of because you're implementing it at a time where we've got, um, we've got the conditions that are for you going to be much easier. Some of us chose to do it because our infrastructure was failing and, you know, we've got people that were complaining and we've got, you know, we've got all these different things of people being um, upset and accusing us of all kinds of different things. In the end, it's, it's, a, it's a public relations discussion and it's how do you implement the best way for your community? And you got to think of your community, what we do, what, what Seth did in, in Spanish, what Norm did in, in Santa Quinn, what Highland did, we all choose to do things for whatever reasons our communities have. Um, you know your community best. And if something we've done helps you, great. Congratulations. We want to save you some money. If, if, uh, if it's not going to work in your community, by all means, don't do that. Um, find what's going to be best for your community. Um, I, uh, Seth, Norm, uh, other thoughts kind of in closing before we jump into some more questions? No, great. Go ahead, Mark. Great, great presentation, Mark. Again, we're here to help and we're here to advocate for you to, to go get the state funding and, and help you in any way that we can with our standards or contract docs or meter types or whatever. Just let us know. I'll just add, uh, and Mark touched on this near the beginning, you, uh, the, the requirement to add meters has been given to us. And at some point, probably many of us, if not all of us, maybe kicked against that and said, we don't want to do it. That decision has been made for us. Uh, and so it, we have an opportunity now to take advantage of it. I think I love Mark's motivations here at getting this conversation out in front of us quickly. So thank you, Mark, for doing this. Uh, let's take advantage of, of the funds as the legislature has made available and really do some good in each of our cities. 
as we go about this, though, I, I'd invite every, all of those listening managers, elected officials as well, uh, to just embrace the opportunity. This will be a headache of a project for sure. Uh, any project like this is a headache, but, but at the end of the day, there's some great positives that can come and will come uh, to, all of our, to all of our cities and to the state. So I think if we embrace it and uh, do our very best, we'll see significant water savings. And that's a great thing. Uh, we, we have put off a couple of projects and uh, probably have put off others that we aren't even aware of yet because of the savings that we've seen in our system and, and our residents fully embraced it. After the punitive rates, we made some adjustments to our rate structure, right, Chris? So they didn't like us for a long time or you know, for, for a handful of years, I should say, but we made some adjustments to our system and, and frankly, our rates have been going down for the last 20 years, right? I don't think we've had a rate increase since that initial start. Uh, lower rates five times. Yeah, yeah we've lowered rates five <laughs> times over, over 20 years. And uh, that continues to be a, an option for us. So embrace it, it's here. Use some of the tools and, and uh, information that Mark has presented. And then in as much as we can help any of us that have been through it, we're, we're happy to. I think some of the best advice to today so far has been Mark suggesting maybe hiring a PIO firm to manage customer uh, questions and complaints. If you if you can stay ahead of those and make sure that uh, the responses are going back to the customers and that they're keeping up to date on you know issues that they have, uh, that's that's going to do wonders for your public opinion. Um, contractors are good at installing things, but they're they're not good public information officers. And so if you take that away from them and, and, and maybe even look at having the city hire the, the PIO directly so that they're working for you, uh, I think that's really good advice. I was just gonna give one uh, similar talking point to what Mark gave on, on the reduction of use. When, when we built our pressurized irrigation system, we, we metered it, but the bill with the metered rates didn't come until about a month and a half into the watering year. And, and our reservoir, we built a huge reservoir uh, for build out is, is what we thought. And we use it for recreational purposes. Uh, our reservoir was going down two feet every night. This huge reservoir was dropping two feet every night. And then the bills came out in the mail, people opened their bills and that very next night, it only went down six inches. So uh, if that gives you a feel for how much less usage once, once the meter grades came. So for us, we did the meters, we did the meter install in the summer of 2014. And then the first few months of the next season, we actually didn't change the rates. We changed rates in July. And those first few months that we were in that you're being metered phase because not everyone goes online being metered all at the same time, right? Because you've got this metering data that's being installed across your community. So for us, we use that springtime to say, okay, and we, we printed on their bill, here's how much water you used based on your lot size, you should have used this, your bill would look like this if you were using, you know, if you were to reduce your watering consumption. And so education becomes really important for us having that, that critical information made available to our residents as part of the utility bills. Again, we were putting it out in social media. It was going out in the media and we were warning people, hey, come July 1, you're going to start having to pay the piper for your overconsumption. And we were able to, to get ahead of that a little bit. Now, there were still some people that were really mad because they believed that, hey, I'm paying a base rate. I should have unlimited water consumption. And we likened this to a gas pump. If we could all pay, say, $20 to, to, to use as much gas as we want, would we be okay with that? Absolutely. Would we kick and scream when they change that rate price? Absolutely. But fundamentally, if I'm staying within my water allotment and Seth is hugely overusing his water allotment, why should we pay the same rate? Um, his overconsumption shouldn't be something that I'm having to subsidize. And so people started to realize, hey, wait a second, 
we shouldn't be subsidizing each other. We should each be paying our fair share and we should each be paying based on our consumption. And if I'm thrifty in my water use, I should be able to reduce my rates. And that's one of the things that we built into our rate calculators is if you use less than what your allotment is, you're saving money over previous rate structures. And so think about your community and think about ways that you can establish your rate structures and communicate to your residents so that it's not just sticker shock. It's not just them getting a massive bill the first time that you start metering. Think of how are you going to educate them? How are you going to transition them? How are you going to let them see their water consumption and understand their water consumption before they get popped with that big financial impact? Because again, um, your council will hear about it. One last bit of advice from me is, and my mayor said this when we were in training down in St. George. Um, he said, notice the mayor and council are not taking the calls. Notice the mayor and council are not implementing this. Notice the mayor and council aren't walking around and helping to install the meters. The mayor and council need to be insulated and you as staff need to help insulate your mayor and council so that you're implementing this and it becomes an administrative function. It's not a political function. You need to be ahead of the complaints. You need to be ahead of the concerns as staff so that your mayor and council can make the right decisions and you guys as a team are really making sure that you've got the customer service nailed down so that they're not being punished for something that is not something that, you know, given the, the state's position and, and the, the adopted standards that we now have to live with, we need to make this as good of a possible solution we can for our, for our councils and, and elected officials. Hey, Mark, I, I concur on that. Carson, can you put the link in there? I see that you've got the, the application. Can you put the link to the email for questions? There's, I'm trying to find it in my emails, but there's in your Friday updates, there's a link to a email address that people can ask questions to, to go to some of these questions. How do we get the state funding? None of us on this panel are experts of that because we're not going after that funding. We're already there. So we apologize that we can't answer those questions, but but there are links in the in the Friday facts if you get that or Carson if you can put a link in there that you can ask questions at the state and they can help you through that process. And, and I believe in addition to the grant monies, I believe there might be also some funding through the state revolving loan funds. Mm -hmm. So you know to pay your thirty percent, you might be able to use some state revolving loan fund money to help fund that gap as well. Again, do yourself a favor, get your meters in the ground and get your projects going as quickly as possible and take advantage of what none of us could, which is 70% 70, 70 funding the next two years, you know, and, and as those rates decrease, but take advantage of that state funding, the legislature, and, and we really have to give the state kudos because they came in big and we told them a year ago, we can't afford this, don't make us, don't put this all on our shoulders. They came in big with some huge money opportunities for us to be successful. We need, we need to also show our support by um, you know, giving them kudos for, for helping us uh, find a funding mechanism and, and uh, encouraging us to do this quickly. Right. And that state revolving fund, our understanding is that it could be as low as 1%. So in today's climate, that's like almost free money as far as the other 30% or whatever percentage you don't get grant funds for. Yeah. How long does it take to drain out the pressurized irrigation system at the end of the year? I'm, that's really going to be system dependent. In Spanish Fork, we have uh, just south of 50,000 people. It takes us about two weeks uh, to open up all the drain, drains and drain out, drain out our system before winter. You know, to that, Chris, we actually created, because we use irrigation water, not always the most pristine water. Um, we actually do a flushing, we created a flushing plan with our consultant. And so at the end of the season, we stop filling our ponds. We let people slowly start bringing that down. And then as we get to kind of those critical levels, we start implementing our flushing plan where we then take and flush our system and use that residual water in the system to flush, which actually is a really good maintenance thing. Um, for those of you that have the ability to drain your systems, um, it, it's a good plan and it helps us, you know, make sure that we get all the sediment and, and, and those kinds of things out of the system on an annual basis. And we do the same. We drain our system and it takes us, like Chris is saying, we only have about 16,000 people and it takes us a couple of weeks to where most of the drains end up drying out. It, it is going to be system dependent. We're, we're fortunate enough that we have most of our stuff is down uphill to downhill. And so very few places do we have low spots and that kind of thing. Most of it's just the end of the system. And we have the same thing, Mark. We have 
worked with our consultant to, to identify some flushing areas so that we, and we've actually put yellow hydrants in to be able to flush even in the middle of the, of the season to get pipe scale and other things that build up in there out of our PRVs, for instance, in our, in our system. All righty. Well, I will go ahead and wrap this up since we're just over 1.30. I want to thank uh, our panelists again, Seth, Chris, Mark, and Norm for your time. This has been tremendously informative. We'll post this recording and all the resources that uh, we can get for you on our website at our spring training page, and we'll distribute it in Friday Facts as well, along with some of the links. I dropped the application link for the, the metering, state metering grants. And there's a lot of other helpful information. There's a QA, and a there's some contact um, emails there. And if there's any other questions that you have, I drop my email if you wanna reach out to me and I'll make sure it gets to the right person. Uh, but I wanna thank you all for your time today. I know this will be a big task, but city's work and we're, we're up to it. So thank you everybody.